even a thief can be an honorable person. I learned that <clears throat> uh, by personal experience. Um, and this story is a story about something that happened while we were living in Haiti. And it can be kind of a long story. So I'm probably going to divide this up into two parts. So this is part one of how even a thief can be an honorable person. During the time that we were living in Haiti, we didn't have a vehicle, but Paul and Esther Overholt were the um, uh, at the guest house in, in Haitianville in Port-au-Prince, and they were going back to the States on a furlough and for a month. And so they gave us a vehicle and they asked us to once a week come into their house, stay there overnight uh, so that the house wouldn't be empty for a month and uh, would reduce the possibility of vandalism at the house. So we were doing that. And um, one particular week we were going in and we stayed at the house overnight and then we were gonna go home the next day and the next morning, I had two things that I wanted to do. Uh, one was Edith had had a, a minor um, surgery on her finger. She had a little growth on her finger that she had removed. And um, so I needed to pay the doctor. And um, this had kind of turned into a bit of a fiasco because I didn't understand the, the system there. And um, so we had gone to this doctor and he had looked at it and said, yes, he can take it off and, and it should be taken off. And so when we got there for him to take it off, well, he had made a big production out of this. And um, it was like a sterilized surgical room, a surgery room. And, and she was just, you know, under sterile blankets and with a little thing with her finger sticking out. And he removed that. And, and um, I didn't ask my mistake was I didn't ask beforehand how much it was going to cost. So when it was done and he told me how much it was going to cost, it was $300 US, which was a lot of money for what he did. Um, later, when we got back to Canada, I filed a claim with the uh, Ontario Health Insurance Plan and they reviewed what the doctor had done and uh, they said that they would have paid a doctor in Canada $9 to do the same procedure. And so I got $9 back. But anyway, I had not asked the doctor beforehand how much it was going to cost. And then he told me it was going to be $300 US. So I didn't have $300 US at the time. So I told him I would pay him. And I asked one of our Haitian friends what to do. And he said, well, both of you made a mistake. You're both in the wrong. You're in the wrong because you should have asked him in advance how much it was going to cost. The doctor is in the wrong because he's charging you too much. So he said, what you should do is you should call him and tell him, I don't have $300 US, but I have $150 and I will come in person and I will give you $150 in US cash if you'll accept that as payment. So that's what I did and the doctor accepted it. So I was going downtown uh, to pay the doctor and Edith wanted me to buy a duffel bag for her. So I was gonna go down to the iron market where they sold duffel bags and buy her a duffel bag and then go to the doctor and pay the bill. So I had the money, this $150 US, plus I had some Haitian money to buy a bag in my pocket. And on the way down there, I just got this feeling, probably when I'm at the iron market, I shouldn't carry that, all my money with me in my pocket. So I took the US money and I put it in the emergency medical kit in the vehicle that I was driving and uh, left it in the vehicle, locked it, and I went to the iron market to look for duffel bags. I was walking, the, the duffel bags were hanging up on the side of the iron market and there were merchants along the iron market. There were merchants on the outside of the sidewalk along the street. 
So as I walked down the sidewalk, there were merchants on both sides, on the street side and on the iron market side. I was looking at the duffel bags on the iron market side. I saw one that I thought she might be interested in, had a nice amount of pockets. And uh, so I thought, well, I could, I could buy that, but I want to look at the rest and see if there's something else. So I went all the way down along the iron market, looked at all the duffel bags. And um, I, I thought, well, I didn't find anything else. So I went back to buy that one. On my way back, I got to a place where there were people going both ways on the sidewalk. There were people coming in from the street and people coming out of the iron market. So there were people trying to go four different directions at that spot and things got kind of jammed up and people were just flat up against each other. I was flat up against the person in front of me with just my head up over their shoulder. The person behind me was flat up against me and people were pressing in on both sides and I felt something jag my leg felt the person behind me. I felt his hand on my leg and felt something jag me. I thought, that person pinched me. And then I looked down and I realized, no, he didn't pinch me. He sliced my pants with a razor blade. And when I felt his hand on my leg, he had felt my handkerchief in my pocket and thought it was money. And he sliced my pants with a razor blade. He had just nicked my leg a little bit with the razor blade. That's what I felt pinching. And then I looked and I saw that on my shoulder, right by my neck, he had his hand and he had the razor blade in a rag right by my neck. And I realized this is a good time to stay really calm because if I react, if I make any noise, I'm dead. He'll slice my throat in a second and I'll, I'll, I'll be finished. So I just stayed calm. I didn't say anything. I didn't move. When people started moving, I started moving went back to the place where the bag was that I wanted to buy and told the lady I'd like to buy the bag. And she looked at me and said, what happened to your pants? And I said, somebody tried to rob me. And she said, you need to leave right now. You, you, you just need to go away. I said, but I want to buy the bag. And she said, did the person get anything? And I said, no, they didn't. I didn't have any money in my pocket. And she said, listen, do you know where that person is? I said, no, I don't. I don't know where they are. She said, well, there's a man out on the street watching you. Is that him? I turned around and looked and said, yeah, that's him. She said, you must leave right away. Like they know you have money somewhere and they're going to kill you so that they can search your body for the money. And I don't want them doing it in front of my stand because it'll ruin my business for the rest of the day. So please just leave. I will leave, but first I want to buy that bag. So he said, okay, do it quickly. She got the bag. I had the money for the bag in my shirt pocket. And so I gave her money. She gave me change and she said, if you have any other money on your person, don't put your change where you have your other money. I said, okay, thank you. I won't do that. I don't have any other money. So I put it in my shirt pocket. I started going back to the car. This man started following me and I realized I'm in trouble because when I get back to the vehicle, the doors are locked and it's going to take me a minute to unlock the door and he's going to have me if he's right behind me. And maybe they do want to kill me to search my body for money. So we were along the main street there, Port-au-Prince by the Iron Market. There was traffic going both ways. I waited until traffic was moving and then I just jumped into the street and dodged, zigzagged between cars, didn't get hit, got across the street and I lost him, got back to the vehicle, went back up to the house, changed my pants. Then I took Hans with me and we went, we paid the doctor and then he wanted to get some pants. So we went to a store to get some pants and um, we went to the store and bought the pants we wanted. When we came out of the store, there was a person with a cloth wiping the vehicle and he was saying, oh, I'm cleaning your vehicle. You should pay me. And I was like, no, no, it's OK. I didn't ask you to do that. When I got around to the driver's side, the driver's door was open. So I realized he wasn't just cleaning the vehicle. He had gotten inside the vehicle, but nothing was missing. I must have come out just at the right time before he had stolen anything from inside the vehicle. 
So I went back up to the guest office. This is crazy. Like I haven't been robbed here the whole time we lived here so far. And this was like nine months into our time in Haiti. And now two robbery attempts in one morning. Like this is crazy. I just want to go back to the country where things are more normal. So we packed up and we headed out to the country. We got down on the waterfront, really a wide street down by the waterfront. And there was a lady going across the street with a five gallon bucket of water on her head. And so she couldn't turn her head very much to watch for traffic. And there was a car that was in front of us. He was a little, he was quite a ways in front of us, but we could see him. And he was trying to miss her. He kept going over to the left, over to the left. And the more he went to the left, the faster she ran. And he thought he was going to get around her. But at the last minute, she took a sprint and she ran and got right in front of the car. And he hit her and she did just a loop up over the car and boom, landed on the street behind the car. Well, I don't know what happened to her. It wasn't safe for us to stop. And, and uh, when something like that happened, and so we just... We just kept going, but it was a terrible thing to see happen. We went a little further. We were getting out to the outskirts of the city. And there was a man tied to a chain link fence. There was a crowd of people around him with machetes. And it looked like they were going to kill him. And the traffic was just going to stop and go. And I could see the terror in this man's eyes probably facing his death by machete and there was nothing that I could do and it was just a terrible terrible scene so I just need to get back to the country where things are normal and where things aren't like they are here in the city and so we went back to the country and uh got back to our home. During that time, we were having a week of special meetings every every evening. There was a meeting and we got back in the middle of the afternoon. And I will pick up the story there in part two about how even a thief can be an honorable thief.